everybody. Do you work with massive sensor image simulation statistics data? And do you need fast, flexible and interoperable services on them? In this case, the big geodata standards or the Open Geospatial Consortium are your friends. In these webinars, we will explore the web coverage service ecosystem through practical use cases that will help you familiarize yourself with the system. My name is Peter Baumann. I'm the editor of the OGC coverage standards. And my name is Alex Dumitru. I'm a core developer of Razdaman, which is the reference implementation to the web coverage service. Hello, so let's start. Today we dive into the WCS extensions, so part two of the webinar. The learning goals are, we want to understand what functionality extensions exist, how can these be encoded, that is what protocol bindings exist, and how do the extensions work after all. Prere prerequisites, as usual, is just a little bit of HTTP and some XML that comes handy. And of course you should know WCS Core. If you want to learn more about this one first, there is a particular webinar about that one. It's WCS Part 1. Good, so let's jump into it. As a little bit of a refresher, the Web Coverage Service Suite is actually arranged around the WCS Core which is the mandatory functionality that every WCS must exist, must support. And this core actually has just very, very focused functionality. It allows to access n-dimensional coverages and determine subsets of them, whereby a subset can be either trimming or slicing. Trimming maintains the dimensionality in the result, so you get a two-dimensional cutout from a two-dimensional image, a three-dimensional cutout from a three-dimensional time series, etc. Slicing, on the other hand, reduces dimensionality. So from an image time series you could cut out a slice and then you get something that has 2D lat long coordinates. Or you drill dr through vertically, so to say, and you obtain a one-dimensional time series that has only a time axis. So this is the subsetting that WCS Core performs. And additionally, it can do a format conversion on the fly to give you back any format requested. So this is what's mandatory. WCS extensions add functionality facets which are optional. So any implementer can decide whether or not to implement a particular extension. However, extensions must be implemented then in completeness. Technically speaking, every conformance class must be com implemented in completeness. So it does not mean that an implementer can choose this uh, particular item and another one is left out of an extension. So this is the granularity that is established. That ensures interoperability. Then we have additionally application profiles which allow for some domain-oriented bundling of core and extensions. So for example for Earth observation that is remote sensing there is an application profile talking about two-dimensional imagery plus types, timestamps. Uh, in MedOcean we would talk about four-dimensional climate data cu cubes and so on. So, now let's jump into it. What are the extensions that we have available that augment WCS Core? We know already about the requests and we have used get KVP so far because it's very handy in a PowerPoint slide. This allows us to download a coverage by using the get coverage request. If you just indicate get coverage as the request type plus the identifier of the coverage, you get the whole coverage and you get it unmodified. It's guaranteed to be unchanged over what is stored in the server. Trimming and slicing is expressed through a subset parameter. In this case, we do time slicing and finally encoding is expressed by adding a format parameter to the request. So that is what we know already from WCS Core. The first extension we look at is actually doing range subsetting. That means we extract range components. If that sounds strange uh, in the terminology chosen, uh, that is the same thing as bands in satellite images or channels or variables. The request gets an additional parameter it's still a get coverage, but now we can say range subset equals red and assume that the coverage on the server has a band called red 
we would get exactly that one. We also can add more such channels. So for example, from a hyperspectral image, we can do a range subsetting to get the visible bands by saying NIR red green. Hmm, that was wrong of course, right? It's a false color image. Okay, you also can do some mixing. You don't need to stay with the given sequence. So you can do a range subset where you get green, red, blue instead of the usual red, green, blue. So sequence is by no means fixed. Good, sometimes we have so many bands that it's unwieldy to enumerate all of them. Think about something like 400 band hyperspectral imagery. Uh, that's not convenient. Therefore it's good to indicate intervals where we say, okay, we start with the near infrared band and we walk up to the green band. So effectively we get NIR, red, green. It's the same thing as the example before, but in a more compact write-up. And all of those options can be mixed freely. So the final example shows how we can enumerate, how we can have intervals, how we can arrange for our sequencing, and all of that allows us to freely select bands in any way we want. Okay, and that's it already about range subsetting. As you see, it's quite simple, quite straightforward, but quite handy. The next extension is scaling. Scaling here meaning reducing the resolution of a gridded coverage. Scaling does not make sense for point clouds, but for gridded coverages it does make sense indeed. Actually we can express that in several ways. We need to uh, indicate some kind of scale factor of course, and the simplest thing is to have one scale factor for all axes uniformly. So if you say scale by factor equals 2.0, in this additional request parameter, then actually we will get back a coverage where the resolution is changed, so we get less pixels, by a factor of 2. By the way, factor 2.0 means scaling down. So although the number is greater 1, it means that the coverage will be smaller. That is just a way to avoid some numerical problems, so that's the best way of doing it. Sometimes you may want to have a scaling individually per axis. Now in light and long you typically have the same scaling, otherwise the image appears distorted. But if you have a three-dimensional time series, for example, you may want to scale time individually, because it's physically of course not tied in any way to light and long. In this case you would use a scale axis by factor parameter, where you can indicate a factor for each axis. In this case, latitude gets scaled by a factor of 2, longitude as well, and time stays unmodified as the factor is 1. Sometimes you want to indicate the target box to the size uh, to achieve the sizing that you want. That also can be achieved and the scale to size parameter allows you to express the extent of that box. So in this example we would say in latitude we want to get 400, 4000 pixels and in longitude we want to get 5000 pixels. Please, dear server, do the scaling in a way that we end up with that kind of coverage. Another variation finally is scaling to some extent. So in the previous one we just indicated the size of it. But here now we can indicate the lower and upper bound and saying for example in latitude we want to have something from 10 to 20 and in longitude from 20 to 30. All of that uh, allows to do a versatile scaling in the different multidimensional situations that uh, we are confronted with. Now you may ask, and what about the interpolation that is applied when we do scaling? Actually this is left unspecified. That means the server is free to use any interpolation method that it wants or that it can do and it does not need to report about that, which is common practice actually with most GISs, I would suspect. If, however, you want to have control over that, then the interpolation extension needs to be supported because this allows exactly that. Looking at that, we see that it gives us control over the server-side interpolation. As said before, without it, it's opaque and the server doesn't have to tell what the interpolation applied is. Okay, again we can differentiate here. In the simplest case we indicate one interpolation method across all axes. 
you see the request here where the interpolation parameter has an identifier. This is a URL following OGC policy and that specifies linear interpolation. That means, dear server, whenever you do something for me that requires interpolation, then let it be linear interpolation. Uh, where do we know which interpolation methods are supported? That is actually reported in the capabilities document where you find the section about interpolation metadata and so if you see linear listed here as it is in our capability snippet then the client can utilize that one. This way it has a clear idea on what it can call and how a request would succeed. Just on the side I mentioned that this could be done specifically per axis. We don't look into that right now, but just let me mention that it's possible to really indicate an interpolation method individually for each axis. Again, that is interesting when we come to time series data cubes, because in lat long you maybe want to have some quadratic interpolation, but along time you may want to have nearest neighbor interpolation. That is something that has occurred in practice. Such use cases actually have been brought to our doors. Good. The next one is the CRS extension. That allows us to get um, coverage back in a coordinate reference system that is different from the one stored on the server, which is its native CRS. So it does CRS transformation. That means we can express the coordinates then in different ways. That's for the result coverage, yes, but it's more than that. Actually, it's also about expressing the bounding box for a subsetting operation in a different CRS. So we gain pretty much freedom here. And the request below shows us how this can be expressed. So we could say that the output CRS is uh, EPSG for 326. And that means we get back a WGS84 image, regardless of what it has been before on the server. We might express some subsetting parameters, which I have left out here, but the subsetting CRS is indicated, which also says, okay, my bounding box coordinates are expressed in 4326 as well. So actually, with the help of these two parameters, you get quite some degree of freedom to express coordinates of input and output. Again, you may ask about the CRS is supported, and again, the answer is look into the capabilities document because their supported CRSs are listed. These CRS definitions, by the way, you see again as URLs. That is OGC policy and OGC also operates a resolver so that when you, uh, when you type uh, the CRL into your browser, actually you will get back a document containing this CRS definition. That can be requested by a machine as well, it's machine readable, but typically they wouldn't do it, but they have this on stock already and now has laid off uh, CRSs. However, that may go uh, and change in the future, because OGC does not also host the EPSG CRSs, but there are more. There are index CRSs, there are more and more time CRSs, elevation is coming, etc. Okay, but this on the side. Uh, there was something else. Interpolation. Yes, CRS transformation also has to do some interpolation. And the same thing as with scaling. If no interpolation extension is supported by the server, it can do anything it wants. Any kind of interpolation. A more clever server or a more communicative server would allow the client to specify the interpolation method, as we have seen before, with the interpolation extension. And in this case, the settings specified by the client would also apply to any CRS operation applied. Okay, a little bit about the CRS names. So this URL write-up may seem a little bit alien. Actually, it is something that allows us to do much more and a few quite useful things. First of all, if we see such a URL, uh, we could interpret this as a RESTful write-up. So we drill down into resources. The CRSs are sets of resources. We go into the EPSG section. We don't care about the version. And we finally drill to the one that has the identifier for 326. So that's a perfectly RESTful way of thinking about URL handling. If that is RESTful, however, we can also write it in a different syntax in KVP notation. 
So we would say, for example, authority equals EPSG, version equals zero, code equals for three to six. That doesn't change anything. Same semantics, just a little bit of a different syntax. However, it opens up new possibilities to add more parameters. So, for example, we could in the next one, with this auto for 2003 CRS, we could add extra parameters. And effectively for this one we need it. Because this is a so-called auto CRS that is defined in the appendix of the webmap service. And that is not a complete CRS. The blue part is just a template that needs to be instantiated with unit of measure and with center longitude and latitude. We do that by just adding parameters here, the red ones, and we obtain a readily usable CRS. So actually we have a way to include the auto CRSs, which always have been something freestanding, to include that into one general framework. But there is even more to it. By def defining a new uh, type, a new branch, that is CRS compound, Actually, OGC has established ways of combining CRSs. So, this URL here, which contains two sub-URL, actually says the following. I am a CRS that, as at first, has EPSG for 3 to 6, so has axis, lat, and long. And it has additionally a third axis, which is ANSI date, which is a time axis. So, altogether, I am a three-dimensional CRS, which is composed from existing lower dimensional CRSs. This mechanism is very handy when we deal with data cubes because it allows us to dynamically compose new CRSs on the fly and they still have a well-defined semantics and every implementation can understand that. For example, the CRS resolver running at OGC is also understanding this. So you could send this URL to the server and you would get back a meaningful response. Okay, so much about CRS names. This shows us how we can deal with multidimensional coordinates, and that's quite useful for coverages. Actually, there will be separate units. Uh, one will be specifically devoted to time series and multidimensional work. So if you want to learn more, log into that one, and we'll tell a few more stories about it. Oh, yes. And the slide wants me to remember that we proudly present the CRS resolver running at OGC actually has been implemented by Jacobs University and is available in open source as part of the Rasterman software. Good, another one. Let's move on to another extension, in this case processing. The processing extension actually is a wrapper defining request types for the OGC Web Coverage Processing Service, or WCPS. This, in fact, is a high-level spatiotemporal GeoRaster query language. So, like in any database query language, you can phrase requests ad hoc. It's just that they don't work on tables like SQL, but they work on rasters, on multidimensional grids, and they understand about space and time semantics. This is embedded into a new request type, Process Coverages. Until now, we always have just extended the Get Coverage requests. Here now, we see an example for a new request type that is introduced by an extension. Below is an example that shows how that can work. So we have our WCS that we address the request now as Process Coverages, and the query is just a string that is passed as a value. This is not URL encoded to make it better readable for us. And so we see that we bind a variable $c to scene1. So this is a loop of length 1, so to say. And with this $c, we do a computation. We do the difference between the red and near infrared channel. And the result, we encode in JP2, so JPEG2000, and return it to the caller. So effectively, this query gets evaluated on the server and the response is a couple, a set of images or a set of aggregate values, for example. Again, there is a specific uh, unit that details WCPS. So I will stop here and rather proceed because we have yet another one that is the transaction extension. This one now does not modify retrieval but it effectively allows to modify coverage offerings on a server via the web. To this end, 
It offers three new request types, Insert Coverage, Delete Coverage and Update Coverage. A request can look like this. We say Insert Coverage, we provide a referen reference to some NetCDF file, say. The server will retrieve that, will resolve that URL, will take that coverage and create a new one in its service offering. So that's a very simple way of adding coverages to a WCS. Again, there's a separate unit which talks about the requests and their parameters, so I will refrain from talking more about that here. Because there is still something left. We want to talk about the protocol extensions. We always have used get kvp so far. Now is there anything else we can do? Actually, yes. There is different protocols available. They all offer exactly the identical WCS functionality. So you can pick your choice of encoding the requests and it will all work the same. Sometimes this is determined by the service environment, by your service ecosystem. So you have the freedom of choice of using this or that protocol. There is get kvp available, which we have seen already. There is XML post, where the requests are ex uh, encoded in XML and sent via a post request. And there is SOAP support, where again requests are encoded in XML, embedded into the SOAP wrappers and then sent to the server. A whistle template, which defines the service, is provided with a standard for the service operator's convenience. And there is a draft out, an advanced draft, actually on a RESTful binding, where requests can be encoded in a RESTful way. Okay, and that's it actually. So now we can put it together and talk about the big picture that WCS offers. This is a non-normative diagram, it's not standardized, it's just there to explain it. And this may look quite complicated in the first glance, but actually if we look at it, we will see that it's not that bad. Let's look at the left column. The left uh, blue area is the data part. You find the GML application schema coverage is there which defines coverages in a format independent way and the format encodings are listed underneath. So we find GeoTIFF, NetCDF, JPEG2000, GML, JP2 and in future several more specifications which, that are in the make. On the service side we find of course the WCS core. This extension world underneath is grouped into several themes so to say and as you see, uh, there has been a lot of activity in the particular, in particular in the middle two scenes or themes. Uh, so services, that is where functionality extension is defined. And you will find exactly those ones that we have been talking about. WCST, processing, range subsetting, scaling, CRS and interpolation. And the other stack that has found quite some attention is protocol bindings. So you find get kvp, post, soap and rest. For the other ones, data model and usability, there is still a place to come and actually data model extensions for example are under consideration in OGC. At the bottom finally we find the application profiles. So this is the big picture explaining how the different core and extension specifications fit together. So we've been talking about this one here. And as I mentioned earlier, separate units are available for WCST and for WCPS. Good. And so I would hand over now to do some hands-on work and see how all of that works in practice. So Alex, please give it a go. The web coverage service has a set of extensions that enhance the functionality of the service. These extensions are optional and can be advertised by the server as we have seen in the get capabilities request. The first that we'll explore is the range subsetting extension. This allows us to select the range fields, also called bands or channels, that we want to request. 
We can check that the extension is enabled by checking the capabilities document in the service identification section for the OWS profile that contains the range subsetting URL. We can see it here and now we know that we can use range subsetting on this server. Let's try to get only the green band for one of the coverages available. Let's say for example multiband. I'll first do a describe coverage on this coverage and look at the range types available. So we have the field code red with capital R, green and blue. So let's request only the green field from this coverage. So let's go back to the capabilities and change the request from get capabilities to get coverage. Let's do the coverage ID. We'll put multiband and then the range subsetting parameter called range subset and we said we're going to select only the green values. I will also add the format parameter to output this coverage in an image GeoTIFF format. So I have here the full URL that I can now use to download the coverage. So let's use wget for this. and let's download it in subset.tiff ok let's download the full coverage as well to see the difference between the two I'll save this in full.tiff and just remove the range subset ok I have both of them here as you can see and let's open the full one as you can see here we have the red, the green and the blue channel available and if we, do, if we change to the subset one we can, only, we can see that the, only the green channel was saved for this coverage. So this is pretty simple. We can also reorder the bands. So let's replace the red band with the green band. We can do this by requesting the bands in a different order than their initial one. So here they are red, green and blue. So let's ask back for green, red and blue. I'll once again run the request in the command line so it's easier to open and I will save it as green red dot if. send the request and after a couple of seconds I should get the response back and let's see how it looks as you can see as opposed to the original one shown here the green channel was replaced by the red channel we can also subset on the range types an interval of range fields so let's for example subset everything from red to blue we have to use the column in order to do this and this would give us all the range fields between red here and blue which is basically the whole coverage so let's try this request as well and see what we get back get using the command line and let's say interval dot if and after a couple of seconds again we will get the response back and it should look the same as the original one so that is all for the range subsetting extension the next extension that we will cover in this webinar is the processing extension that helps you issue WCPS queries using a standard WCS defined interface. Let's first check that the processing extension is available in the get capabilities document. So I run the get capabilities request and check in the service identification section that a processing URL processing extension URL is present as a profile and I can see it here so it means that the server supports this extension 
Let's see how to issue such a request. I'll first change the request from get capabilities to process coverages and then I'll input the query in the query parameter. So let's do a very simple WSPS query, for example, for C in C001, return encode C as comma separated value. So that's all, let's run the URL and see what we get back. I will use directly the output in the console. So as you can see, we got a comma separated value response with the values of this coverage. Let's for example multiply it by 2 here to see what we get. And as you can see, from 119 I get 238 and so on. So it's that simple. We can also add numbered placeholders to the request. Let's see how to do this and let's go back to the web interface and I will change uh, the query here for example to have a placeholder multiplying to C and then let's subtract the second placeholder. So these placeholders will be textually substituted by the values that will be coming in the next parameters. So I can say here in the parameter list that the first placeholder should be replaced by 3 and the second placeholder let's say should be replaced by 20. So now the query will be something like returning code of 3 multiplied by C minus 20. Let's see how this works. Once again, run it with wget and output it here in the terminal. So as you can see, we already run the request and the numbers are adjusted properly. To make it even more obvious, let's just multiply it by 0 and you will see that we get only minus 20s back. So that is all that you need to know in order to run the WCPS queries inside the WCS endpoint. Another extension that I will show is the scaling extension. It allows us to scale coverages either as a whole or on a single axis. Let's see first if the scaling extension is enabled in the web interface in the get capabilities document. So let's run a get capabilities request and as you can see we have it here as a profile. That means we are allowed to issue scaling requests. There are multiple ways in which you can scale a coverage and we will cover all of them and we'll start with the scale factor. To issue a scaling operation in a get coverage request you will have to first add the scale the coverage ID here and we will call it multiband and then the scale factor which tells the service how to scale the coverage let's for example put 10 here and it will scale the coverage 10 times downwards let's also output the result in an image GOT format so that it is easier to visualize. We'll go back to the console and request the result. Let's say scale.tiff. And uh, if you remember, the original one had 4000 pixels over almost 5000 pixels. Now the scaled one, which was scaled by a factor of 10, will only have 465 pixels by 492 pixels. So indeed it was scaled. We can also scale on individual axes using a factor. To do this, we replace the scale factor parameter 
with the scale axis parameter parameter so let's do this and let's say that we want to scale on the easting axis again let's say with a factor 5 so let's see again in the console what we get back and we got back a response containing the geotiff and as you can see the easting uh, axis which correspond to the X dimension on the raster was reduced uh, fivefold. The last method of scaling that I will show uses geographical coordinates to indicate the bounding box of the scaled version. To do this we can use the scale extent parameter with the following values. So let's add the scale extent parameter here and let's do it again on the easting axis and I will have to add some subset here so it will be separated by a column the low and high values of the interval this will scale the whole coverage to the extent defined by this geographical bounding box on the easting axis so let's try it again And we got back a result and as you can see again the WCS service computed the necessary scale factor for us from the bounding box and we get the scale image back approximately what we wanted one thing to be considered is that the scaling extension does not specify the interpolation method to be used the server can choose any of them based on its internal configuration. We can, however, choose the interpolation method using the interpolation extension. Let's look again on the, in the get capabilities document. And under the service metadata section, we see that the interpolation extension lists the interpolation method supported. In this case, it supports the nearest neighbor uh, interpolation method. So let's see how we could use this. Again, we have the scale extent, and all that we have to do is add the interpolation parameter with the correct URL. Let's do it once again in the command line. We paste the request and let's say scale interpolation that if so we got it back and you'll notice that the result is exactly the same as the interpolation method that we added is the default one as well so that's pretty much everything that you need to know about the scaling extension The last extension that I will show in this webinar is the transactional extension that allows you to insert, update and delete coverages from a web coverage service. I won't go into details uh, with regards to this extension as there is another webinar that explains uh, the transactional extension in detail and deals with data ingestion in general into the services offered by Rosdaman. So let's just show the, show the basic functionality of this extension and let's first check that it is available I run a get capabilities request and as you can see the transactional extension is listed in this profile here so let's try to insert the coverage first I have a GML coverage here named my coverage that has the EPSG 4326 ERS and the 1 to 3 extends on latitude and 1 to 10 extends on longitude. Okay, so let's see how to issue an insert coverage request. We change the request parameter to insert coverage and then we add coverage ref parameter 
that will point to the URL of this coverage. That is all that I have to do. I will press send and I get back as a result the name of the coverage. So I now know that my coverage was correctly inserted into the web service. I can run a describe coverage request, change it to coverage ID and add the coverage ID as my coverage, send a request and as you can see the my coverage uh, coverage has been inserted correctly. I can also delete the coverage and for this I'll change the request to delete coverage and coverage ID will be equal to my coverage. I'll send a request and I got back an empty response meaning that uh, no mistake was done in deleting the coverage so everything is fine. So we have seen how the WCS extensions work. Let's spend a couple of moments on the protocol bindings as well. A protocol binding defines the method of transporting the request information from the client to the WCS server. ORAG examples so far have used the KVP GET encoding, meaning that you use key value pairs of uh, parameters in a GET request to the WCS endpoint. I will now show you how to do the basic operations using the XML POST protocol binding. So let's uh, delete this and leave only the endpoint and let's change the method here to POST. So now all the requests we will be sending via POST to this endpoint here. Let's issue a GET capabilities request and I will choose here XML to highlight it. And let's see how we get capabilities encoding looks like. So I have uh, pasted here the get capabilities request, and as you can see, it contains the get capabilities XML tag. And inside, you can either specify directly the version or specify a list of versions to accept. For example, here I'll only specify the 2.0.1. I can run it, so this will be sent via POST to this endpoint and I'll get back again the capabilities document as we uh, requested. We can see here that in the operation metadata section that the endpoint for the POST protocol binding is the same as the one for KVP. This is why we could use the same endpoint here uh, to issue the POST requests. Let's also do a describe coverage request. And I'll again copy paste the XML document. And that's pretty much it. We only have to specify the coverage ID and surround it with a describe coverage tag. Let's run the request. And as you can see, we got back the result for C001 only the metadata as we issued the describe coverage. Let's do a get coverage request as well and again I'll copy paste the XML here. Very simple. You only have to specify the coverage ID surrounded by a get coverage element. So I can run the request again and see that I get back the data as well in this get coverage request. That is all that you need to know about protocol bindings and about WCS extensions. So, let's wrap up. You have survived it. We talked about the optional WCS extensions that add functionality to the mandatory WCS core. The functionality facets that we have seen is range subsetting, scaling, CRS transformation, interpolation, processing, WCST, etc. This is a growing list. We carefully deliberate whether some extension should be added to not overcomplicate it, but as a user's request more and more functionality, 
we need to adapt to that and add more functionality. For example, one thing that is in the make is polygon clipping of gridded coverages. Then we have talked about protocol bindings and we have seen that the same request can be encoded in different ways. And so actually there is a WCS ecosystem where implementers are free to decide how complex and how service rich their particular implementation should be. This can be handled dynamically because the capabilities document always tells us what extensions actually are supported. And therefore a client can always find out what this server can do for us. So if you want to continue the next webinar I would suggest is look into WCST because that tells how such coverages that we have retrieved today can be updated on server side. Thanks for bearing with me and see you. Bye bye.